Hello and welcome to episode 18 of the Watership Down podcast. So, definitely no sound drops in the last episode, something I'll try to ensure continues. This week we look at chapter 20, but first a brief look at a character in the book who has been changed perhaps more than any other in screen versions of the story. Strawberry. The chapter we will look at today is the one in which Strawberry comes into his own, vindicating Hazel's accepting him into the group. He is the only rabbit who arrives at Watership Down with the group, who is not from Sandalford, and his emotional journey in the book is fascinating. He begins as a deceptive and weird member of the Warren of the Snares, then becomes a desperate escapee who has finally realised he has been living a lie, possibly due to his losing his mate Nildro Hain to the Snares. Then he becomes a little mentioned member of the group as they arrive on Watership Down. As the story progresses, he becomes more and more impressive as a member of the group, eventually being indistinguishable from those who left Sandalford. This chapter is the one in which that really begins. One of the many things that really annoys me about the 1999 TV series is the treatment of Strawberry as they arrive on the Down, which goes directly against what happens in the book. He is portrayed as a lazy, decadent slob who wants nothing to do with digging the new Warren, though he redeems himself later, his portrayal in the distinct third series being very different, both in appearance and attitude. I just don't see what the point is of such a delayed redemption. In fact, this seems to be a bit of a theme of the 1999 TV series, as Bigwig seems to get the same treatment. His pomposity as he trains his new owls are later being replaced by genuine bravery. Is it just that the original story didn't provide a sufficient supply of flawed characters for an entertaining cartoon series? In the 2018 Netflix series, Strawberry has changed to a female character. Speaking personally, this is an aspect of revisionism that I don't mind so much, as a better gender balance in the story works well. And this time, Strawberry's character is not especially diminished in the telling, beyond the general flaws of this miniseries. You may have noticed I haven't even mentioned the 1978 film yet. The reason for this is very simple. Strawberry is completely edited out of the story in the first screen version of Watership Down. Arguably, this was justified by the need to heavily summarise the story in that version, in which the group seemed to spend barely two minutes in the Warren of the Snares, but it still seems a shame. To sum up, I think that Strawberry is a character who has been changed to his detriment in the screen portrayals of Watership Down perhaps more than any other. Overall, I think this is a shame for such a positive figure of redemption. Chapter 20. A Honeycomb and a Mouse. This chapter is a bit of a mixed bag of themes. Contrary to what fans of the 1978 film might expect, we do not proceed immediately to Holly recounting the events that led him to Watership Down. The opening quotation from the oldest surviving written work in history, The Epic of Gilgamesh, simply emphasises that Holly has clearly been through a lot, and the details are left for the chapter after this one. We are told first of the position Holly, or rather Captain Holly, held at the Sandalford Warren, in which he was a natural second-in-command, a wonderfully military concept, as John Ruths has confirmed in an email after the last episode. The living hell he has clearly endured since then is the making of him as a character of note in Warship Down. And without yet knowing any further details, we also now have a calm confirmation of Fiverr's supernatural abilities, just in case the Warren of the Snares wasn't enough. Holly is described as having been a stander of no nonsense, but a bit lacking in the rabbit sense of mischief. Clearly a very brave rabbit, but a bit boring. To find such a rabbit at the foot of Watership Down in these circumstances is clearly very shocking for those present. Hazel once again demonstrates his leadership qualities by quickly coming to his senses and taking charge. This is a rabbit smelling of blood, crying uncontrollably in open country who could already be being hunted. He tells Dandelion to get Bigwig and then to return to the group and tell them what has happened, but not to come down to join them. Hazel then becomes aware of another rabbit nearby who approaches him. He asks him why he didn't help Holly, and he excuses himself by saying he couldn't help him if he tried. He too is exhausted. Bigwig arrives, 
taken aback that it is Holly they have heard, and then recognises the other rabbit as Bluebell. Holly is coming to his senses and recognises Bigwig. Then Bluebell indulges in his trait of telling really bad jokes, which annoys Hazel at first until Holly explains he has managed to keep going because of these. It takes a long time to get Holly up the hill to the holes halfway up the slope. He's in a bad way. As they are nearing the holes, Pipkin joins them, despite Hazel's instruction. Hazel says that Bluebell and Holly should be given a burrow of their own, and asks Dandelion and Pipkin to look after them there. Bigwig comments to Hazel that he won't forget how Hazel left the ditch ahead of him to see whatever it was that was approaching them. It is one of those incremental moments in which Bigwig's respect for Hazel as leader increases. He also very much plays the role of the second in command with the group, suppressing too many questions about what has happened so that Hazel doesn't have to. The next day is also hot, and Hazel takes the rabbits in small groups to the top to continue digging under the beach hanger. He asks Strawberry about the great burrow, and learns that it was strengthened with roots not only in the roof, but they are allowed to grow down into the floor. He's disappointed at the idea of having such obstacles in their great burrow, but Strawberry reassures him that they do not really get in the way. In fact, they will make the burrow warmer, and will conduct sound from outside, which could be useful. The new great burrow is named the Honeycomb, for reasons that seem unclear to me. Do the tree roots really justify such an instant nickname? Hazel is content to allow Strawberry to direct its digging, as he clearly knows what he's doing. The north end of the Honeycomb is supported heavily by tree roots. The central part is more open, and the southern end, where there are no tree roots, is supported by large blocks of earth bays that lead to, into three or four runs. By the end of the afternoon that day, the honeycomb has basically taken shape, which seems like an impressive work rate. I don't know enough about rabbits' digging speeds to know if this is realistic. Suddenly, there is a stamp of alarm as a kestrel has been spotted. Once the rabbits are under cover, this leads to a conversation about how much danger a hawk actually represents, with Bigwig saying that he would like to stand up to the allele from time to time. Silver spots a field mouse trapped out in the open. It seemed doomed to be caught by the kestrel, but Hazel suddenly decides to help it, going out in the open and telling it to run to their holes. This is the first mention in the book of the simple lingua franca that animals can use to communicate with other species. In a dramatic scene, the mouse only just makes it to cover before the kestrel lands heavily just outside the entrance. Silver asks Bigwig if he still wants to stand up to such a lil. However, Bigwig is more concerned with what the point is of helping creatures such as mice. Dandelion arrives to report on Holly, who has had a bad night but is showing signs of recovery. He says Holly would probably prefer to be with the rest of the group now, and deci Hazel decides that they will all spend the night in the new rough dug honeycomb as long as no one minds. Dandelion asks about the mouse, so Hazel says he will explain his thinking on this later. Meanwhile, they need to speak to Holly. Holly is in good spirits and curious for information. Hazel proudly tells him that the whole group who left Sandalford have made it to the down, though not without injury. Strawberry joins them, and having suppressed his greeting gesture from his old warren, calls Hazel Hazel Ra, which surprises Holly. He says that everyone wants to sleep in the honeycomb, and they are curious to hear Holly's account of what has happened since they left Sandalford. Holly warns them that what he has to say will not be easy to hear. They all make their way up the slope to the beach hangar, where Holly greets Silver, a fellow Owlsler member from Sandalford. He also talks to Fiverr, saying that he wishes the Thraya Ra had listened to him. Holly then asks Silver to make it clear to the group that he is not going to try to dominate the group in, it, in any way, and that he respects Hazel's leadership, all the more so because they all made it to Warship Down alive. Bigwig says they are keen to hear what he has to say. Holly had assumed they would be speaking above ground, and the honeycomb is a big surprise to him. It is a bit warm, but Strawberry says there are ways of making it cooler in the summer. Holly is just about to begin when Speedwell enters to say that the mouse would like to speak to Hazel. The mouse, who has an Italian accent for some reason, makes it clear that he would like to help them if ever he can, in return for helping him. Bigwig, as ever when it comes to thinking outside the box, is sceptical. They rejoin the rest of the group, and Holly begins. 
Next time, we learn of the terrible fate of the Sandalford Warren. Mm -hmm.